Brace yourself. You're about to meet one of the wickedest villains to ever limp across a stage. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, limps because he was born with several deformities. As you can see, his withered arm, hunched back and uneven stride are hardly the Renaissance ideal of handsome. Even dogs bark at him as he hobbles past. We might feel sorry for Richard if it wasn't for his sick, twisted mind. Like many of Shakespeare's villains, Richard enjoys revealing his deep, dark thoughts to the audience. In the opening scene, while everyone is off celebrating the end of another bloody battle, Richard stalks the palace halls alone. He's seething because his brother, Edward, is now the King of England. This is because the House of York has defeated the House of Lancaster, seized the English throne, and executed the Lancastrian king and his son. This recent massacre is the latest in a series of civil wars that took place during the famous Wars of the Roses. But that's enough history. Let's get back to Richard. The party atmosphere sickens him. His appearance prevents him from being a lover boy, so he won't even bother. Richard finds villainy far more entertaining. In fact, he's already plotted to pit his two older brothers, Clarence and King Edward, against one another. Richard has taken advantage of Edward's superstition and allowed him to believe a strange prophecy that someone with G in their name will murder Edward's children. Since their brother Clarence's full name is George, Duke of Clarence, Richard knows he can convince Edward that Clarence will be the killer. Funny though, Richard's full name is Richard, Duke of Gloucester. King Edward has lots of reasons to be worried. When Clarence enters, he's surrounded by armed guards who are escorting him to the Tower of London. Richard's plan is working. Clarence is already going to prison. Of course, Richard pretends to be shocked that Clarence has been arrested. Poor, trusting Clarence has no idea that Richard was the one who engineered this whole situation. Richard blames their sister-in-law, Queen Elizabeth, also known as Lady Grey suggesting that she manipulated King Edward into having Clarence arrested. Richard promises Clarence that he'll get him out of the tower. Yeah, right. After Clarence is taken to the tower, we meet Lord Hastings. He's just been released from the tower after being locked up by Queen Elizabeth and her brother, Anthony Woodville. Hastings tells Richard that King Edward is very sick and might die soon. This is great news for Richard, but, of course, he doesn't say that. Instead, he laments how his brother's rich diet has finally poisoned him. But as soon as he's alone on stage, Richard reveals his ghoulish delight. With Clarence in the tower and Edward about to kick the royal bucket, Richard is one step closer to the throne. The only snag would be if Edward keeled over before Clarence and Clarence seized power. To prevent this, Richard decides to feed Edward more lies about Clarence so that Edward will have him executed. Richard then decides he'll seduce Lady Anne, old King Henry's daughter-in-law. She was married to King Henry's son, Prince Edward, who was recently murdered by, you guessed it, Richard. Oh, and Richard murdered King Henry too. Of course, he's not pursuing Lady Anne out of love. It's all part of his slimy political strategy. Will Richard be able to woo this woman after he's murdered her husband and father-in-law? Surely not. On his way to speak to his dying brother, King Edward, Richard encounters Lady Anne. 
she's escorting the coffin containing old King Henry to its burial ground. Lady Anne is in deep mourning for the House of Lancaster, whose bloodline has now ended, thanks to Richard. So when Richard shows up, she hurls all her worst curses at him. This is a fascinating scene, not only for Lady Anne's awesome insults, but also for the way Richard successfully charms her. Richard admits to murdering her husband, Prince Edward, but says her beauty made him do it. Smooth. He also offers to kill himself if she honestly thinks he deserves it. That was probably the clincher. When Lady Anne hesitates at the chance to kill Richard, he pops a ring on her finger. Not only does she accept the ring, but she also agrees to go to Richard's house and wait for him while he buries King Henry. Holy smokes! Talk about a change of heart! Richard can barely believe it himself. Has any man, let alone a toad like Richard, ever won a woman over in such a situation? Unlikely. The seduction of Lady Anne even makes Richard rethink his ugliness. Maybe he can be a sexy lover boy after all. Nah, being evil is way more fun. He'll marry Lady Anne, but he says he won't keep her long. Uh Uh-oh, you know what that means. Are you shocked by Richard's wickedness yet? Don't worry, he's only just getting warmed up. And if you think Lady Anne is good at insults, wait until you meet Queen Margaret, old King Henry's widow and grieving mother of Prince Edward. Cut to a room in the palace where Queen Elizabeth is fretting over King Edward's deteriorating health. She is with her brother, Rivers, and two sons from her previous marriage, Lords Grey and Dorset. Elizabeth also has two sons to King Edward, the eldest of whom is still too young to rule England if Edward dies. If that happens, Elizabeth worries about the amount of influence Richard will have over the throne while her son comes of age. Elizabeth's a smart cookie. She's on to Richard. She knows that Richard loves power and hates everybody, especially her family. When the Duke of Buckingham and Lord Stanley enter, they tell Queen Elizabeth to buck up. King Edward seems much brighter today. In fact, Edward wants to heal the relationships among the extended royal family. He has summoned everyone here today so they can work out their issues and be friends. When Richard enters, he's outraged. He wants to know who's been moaning to King Edward that Richard doesn't like them. Richard throws a big, fat pity party here. He complains that he's misunderstood because he's deformed. He's unable to look handsome and charm people, so they assume he's out to get them. Queen Elizabeth explains that no one complained to the king It was the king who picked up on Richard's bad vibes. So Richard turns on her. He openly accuses her of disgracing him, imprisoning Clarence, devaluing the nobility and promoting her friends. Elizabeth denies all this and stands up to Richard, so the argument escalates. Meanwhile, old Queen Margaret is sharpening her claws in the background. Remember, she was the wife of King Henry and mother of Prince Edward, both of whom Richard recently murdered. So now she has no husband, no son, no title, nothing. She just hangs out in the palace, cursing everyone for stealing her life. Interestingly, during the Wars of the Roses, the wives of the murdered kings and princes were usually spared because they were considered harmless. But when they're furious over the deaths of their husbands and sons, are they really that harmless? 
While Queen Elizabeth and Richard are squabbling, Margaret quietly curses them both. Eventually, she steps forward and calls them all pirates for squabbling over power that doesn't even belong to them. She is the real queen. Richard tries to shut her up, but that just makes her feistier. She yells violent, blood-curdling curses against Elizabeth, her young son, Prince Edward, and everyone who stood by while Margaret's own son was killed. But she saves her best curses for Richard. She wants him to suffer the most out of everyone, in this life and the next. The insults Margaret throws at Richard are truly legendary. But before she can finish her curse, Richard finishes it for her by ending the curse in her name. Don't you hate it when that happens? So now everyone's cursed, except for the Duke of Buckingham. Margaret has no beef with him. In fact, before she leaves, Margaret warns Buckingham to watch out for Richard. He's a dog that kills when he bites. But Buckingham brushes her off. When King Edward asks to see everyone, Richard hangs back. He boasts about how clever he is for deceiving everyone and how oblivious they all are. To top it off, he meets the two assassins he's hired to murder his brother, Clarence. Since King Edward has decided he wants peace in the palace, Richard is taking matters into his own hands. Cut to the Tower of London. Clarence is telling his jailer about a nightmare he had. He dreamt he drowned and was tormented by the souls of people he'd cheated and killed. That's what you'd call a bad omen, because shortly after this, Richard's assassins show up. One of them starts to have second thoughts, but then he remembers how much money Richard is willing to pay him. Clarence eloquently pleads for his life, but it's no use. One of the assassins stabs him twice and dumps his body in a barrel of wine. The other assassin doesn't help. His conscience gets the better of him after all. He regrets being involved in Clarence's murder and tells the other assassin to take all of Richard's blood money. As you've probably already worked out, this is not a play for the faint-hearted. In the world of Richard III, you're either predator or prey. How far will Richard go to secure the crown for himself? Stay tuned for Act Two. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.